present in the Ukrainian poetry, or you have several poetic approaches that are dealing with each other. I don't know, in the Israeli poetry, we always have this kind of one or two approach, poetic approaches okay. to poetry that are more uh, powerful. So w what's going on in Ukraine? Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for the question. Thanks, Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, for supporting uh, this book. Uh, poetry, poetry approaches in Ukraine. I would define two of them, which are uh, very connected or disconnected, actually creates no doubt. And the first one is the, uh, the poetry of daily things, uh, the poetry of small situation and the poetry of life, which everybody is dealing with like on a daily basis. Uh, the landscapes, uh, the events, the political, the historical uh, context which people live inside of it, uh, the relationship between people, uh, whatever you can call the life, this is all in Ukrainian poetry, very detailed, uh, funny, and heroic, and this is important, I would say. And the second approach is I would say quite philosophical and very general dealing with really important questions of, okay. So the second approach is uh, like really philosophical and general dealing with uh, important ideas and important questions of mankind in general, of, of human beings. Uh, dealing with the things uh, human uh, beings have been asking themselves about for ages. And so when you bring uh, the stuff together, uh, you are able to create something really understandable and close to people. So like there is now this intellectual barrier uh, between the authors and the readers. Basically everybody can take the book and find something that is close to him, that is connected to his own life and his own feelings and but this creates the way to provide the conversation about philosophical and general ideas. So I'll ask you two follow questions. One is if you have a distinguish between poets that are more dealing with daily life and poets that are more involved in philosophical approach, that's, that's the first question. And the other one is if you have also kind of separation in the language, let's say, like some of them are using harmony and music and rhythm more, and some of them are, are using daily language and, and street language, and are, uh, in a way, what modern, modern poetry did, just taking away the harmony and music. So in both cases, that's the answer for the both questions, the mixture is the trick, because when you mix, uh, is the harmonica like this, daily life poetry and philosophical aspects. And when you mix languages like uh, high-level literature Ukrainian with the daily words that everybody would use uh, with maybe some uh, kind of surzhik, which is Ukrainian uh, invention, the, yes, kind of the mixture of Ukrainian, Russian, and all the other languages that have ever uh, been existing in the territories of Ukraine, and the dialects, because we have the Western Ukrainian dialects and the Central Ukrainian dialects and so on and so far. So the mixture is the trick, because like when you're when you mixing bloods, you get healthy and beautiful individuals. And it works the same with the poetry. When you mix those different approaches in one poem, then the poem is good and it has the wide circle of readers. And uh, a lot of people can uh, find it Useful, inspiring, nice, beautiful, and so on. So that is, that, that is the most valuable things for me uh, in Ukrainian poetry. And then the music and the harmony. Uh, we are lucky uh, to have the language, we are super lucky to have the language, uh, which is very suitable for slobotonical poetry. So we really can do the rhythm and rhymes, and this creates obviously the extra atmosphere, which you use in order to uh, to deliver your idea in the best way. So uh, we still do have a lot of uh, syllabotanical poetry, which mostly I do also. And I'm super happy that the translator managed to keep the rhythm and to keep the rhymes. 
uh, they they not do it all often. Like if uh, I get new translations into German or Polish or even English, they never try to but, keep but the they, rhymes and rhythm. These languages are harder with music and harmony. Than Hebrew? Than Hebrew, yeah. Okay, then you are also lucky. Yeah. Uh, still, uh, obviously, uh, we uh, fell as a victims of this uh, Central European tradition of free verse from verse labor, and uh, we also have a lot of powerful poets who uh, write without, uh, with a special inner rhythm and without rhymes, and this poetry is also great. And I, I try to do this sometimes also. I, 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 I just think about Ceylon, that comes from the place we met in, yes, which, which sure is a very, very interesting example for this, in a rhythm. He doesn't use rhythm, but, but his language is... I would say you always have, like in any kind of poetry, whether it have, has rhymes or yeah. not, you would always have the inner rhythm, because this is what differs poetry from any random text. You can catch this the breeze of the speaker, the, the rhythm of the souls, and this is important, that's one of the most important things of poetry. Okay, so um, I want to try just deal with one more thing about the wider Ukrainian uh, aspect and then we'll go to your poetry, and that's the, the, the place that poets, Ukrainian poets have in the society, in the Ukrainian society, and I mean the relationship between the politic life and the poetic life. Uh, the place that poets have inside society as moral figures, as spokesmen for you know different voices, like we have this habit in Israel. And and one more thing is what we talked about last night as well. When I was visiting Chernobyl, I, I noticed that you are the first generation or second generation of Ukrainian literature, and it makes and give you a, a very special place and role in Ukrainian history. In a way. So Let's call it Ukrainian ind independent literature yeah. because the Ukrainian literature that exists in Ukrainian language has a long, long, long history and long tradition. But uh, yeah, we can call me like the second generation of Andrukhovich would be the first one and the second yeah. of the independent Ukrainian literature. So what was the question about again? I was doing it two long questions. The first part is about the place of poets in the society, in the Ukrainian society today. In, in their, their uh, involvement with politics, with public opinion, as figures that, that the, the public want to hear their opinions about the, the you know, actual questions, about the conflict with Russia, and so on. So, uh, we are the nation which still has the tradition of reading poetry. Like, taking poetry and reading it. We have a country where you can find poetry in newspapers and serious magazines like... Uh, we had some years when uh, the franchise for the Forbes was running in Ukraine and so we, we had the Forbes Ukraine and once I had my poetry there I don't think you would have the poetry in any other kind of Forbes magazine. So, and this... Uh, this place is the also to, to, to some place in society. But again, it depends on the poetry you write and on the uh, ideas and themes you work with. Uh, there are some figures who are really politically active and very important voices for a lot of people, like Sergei Zhodan, uh, partly like probably me. Uh, there are people like Katarina Kalitko, who was also published in the same publishing house in Hebrew, uh, like. Uh, let's say Bogdana Matiyash, uh, who are not involved in uh, political life, in actual social uh, themes, but they are more philosophical and lyrical, and so it basically depends on, on, on the author. But yeah, there are some people who have a pretty important place in, uh, in society because of the poetry they write. Because this is the, since we read poetry, we, I mean Ukrainians, then that's the way to deliver ideas. And then if you have this way, you should use it to deliver ideas that you uh, consider as important ideas. So obviously we do this. Uh, we have very, uh, very wide uh, spread of poetry in social medias. Uh, you can find some pages uh, of Sergei Zodan, let's say, who would have like 60,000 fans People who are reading and posting his poetry to their accounts. 
uh, we have a lot of Twitter accounts with poetry, and uh, you can hear poetry on TV. Uh, you can have a poetry inside of Syria, a political analytic article. So uh, it really depends on each exact poet. But yes, the poetry has the important place in the society. So uh, that's the place in the interview that I'm envious you know, because the case here is not the same. Um, one more thing before we go to your poetry, uh, and it's about Judaism. When, when I was in Chernovic in the festival, I noticed that, that a lot of occasions were involving Jewish heritage, music, and art, and, and there was this, I felt this longing of the place, I don't want to say Ukraine, but the longing of Chernovich anyway, to the Jewish history uh, they had, like 40% of the population were Jews. My father came from Odessa, 40% of the population of Odessa was Jews. So I want you to say something about the place or the public opinion in Ukraine or your opinion about this heritage, about the relationship between Jews and Ukraine and how you see it today or how you see it can develop uh, further into the future. Uh, it definitely should be developed because this common cultural heritage uh, Jewish Ukrainian cultural common heritage is huge. Uh, when we say Ukraine, uh, we mean the rich and long and difficult history. So, uh, the territory of Ukraine, which, which is nowadays Ukraine, it was Russian Empire, it was Mongolian Empire, some parts of it were belonging to Turkey, or Poland, uh, Austro Hungarian Empire, uh, Great. Lit Litva Kingdom and so far and so on and uh, but if we consider the territory uh, there were times where up to 50% of inhabitants were Jewish people uh, different kind of Jewish minority we cannot even call them minorities if they are like 50% of people so and so uh, for ages and ages and ages those people Ukrainian and Jews used to live together to do their daily life together, to uh, exchange the traditions, the cultural product, whatever they were, the songs, poetry, writing, uh, some celebrations, like would you have uh, some holidays in the villages or some difficult historical situation, they were helping each other or not helping each other, killing each other, marrying each other, and this is life, and life creates this cultural heritage. So it is huge, and uh, it should be uh, rediscovered because it's very rich and very inspiring. Uh, the organization, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, actually what they do is they are trying to bring back common cultural heritage of Ukrainians and Jews. Um, if you come to Israel, if I come to Israel and talk to people, uh, I would discover everybody, everybody has the grandma or grandpa or grand grandma or grand grandpa who comes from Ukraine. Obviously, like uh, I, I mean, there are some people who do not have, but not we so have, much of them. Uh, and okay, but a lot of uh, at least you have mixed marriages, so at least you're gonna find one old lady who came here in 18th or in 19th century from. Galicia, which was Austro-Hungarian period or something like that. And so the same in Ukraine. Uh, there are not so much people who don't really have some Jewish blood because there were a lot of Jews and they used to live all together. So then they, they mix and people mix, traditions mix. I'm the one actually not to have any Jewish blood somehow. Uh, so that's how I, I, I create my own connection because the poetry is a blood, it comes through the heart every time, so it works more or less like this. And uh, yeah. this heritage should be definitely brought back. Okay, so now we'll try to go deeper in your, to your biography and poetry. And the first thing which I, I think you have to ask any poet or any writer, which is the real biography we have, is the reading brother. And I want to ask which, which poets or writers were a big influence at you, on you. And you can, if you can like do uh, some, some kind of chronicle development that you're reading and then you're writing, who were the poets that were 
there for you in every step of your life? Uh, you know that this answer uh, has the beginning but has no end. Yeah. Because you can list and list and list and list and list and then remind and, list and keep listening. So, so try, uh, you know, the, the important ones maybe. I uh, grew up in a totally uh, Soviet family. Uh, everybody was born in, in Ukraine somewhere. But everybody would define themselves as Soviet people. The Moscow is the capital of our motherland, and we all are heading to communism. My grandfather was a teacher of scientific communism in university, and uh, obviously I started uh, my my uh, masterpieces of Russian literature. Uh, they did not really take any efforts to look up to some poetry for kids, so we uh, started ahead from uh, Pushkin, Lermontov. Uh, there was also uh, some poetry uh, from Rudyard Kipling because it was widely translated in Soviet Union. Uh, then, when it comes to poetry, uh, later I discovered some kind of Ukrainian literature like Shevchenko and Franco and Lesya Ukrainka, and all the rest I discovered it way later because uh, I, I was never told it exists. Uh, what else was I when I was a teenager? Uh, I was actually somehow a big fan of Shevchenko, and this this is the national Ukrainian writer. I yes. Very statue. <laughs> yeah, uh, and this is not very uh, like uh, because as she's very old and very traditional poetry. Nobody likes that. But I actually was a big fan of it, and I I, I still am because he was very like Ukraine freedom and stuff. But at the same time, he is very emotional and very gentle and very rich with metaphors and so on. And he used to have a beautiful language. Uh, those Ukrainian language that I have never heard before in my surrounding, even though I was born in Soviet Russian speaking family, but in the Western Ukraine, which was anti-Soviet. So like the mixture cr gives the result. And then uh, then I discovered some something from American poetry, like. Walt Whitman, uh, I discovered something from Europe like uh, Lorca. Uh, all translated to Ukraine? Yeah, to Russian. Russian. That was still the time, I mean, the Ukraine was independent for already at those times, but still all the books we had were the Soviet books. And then uh, I discovered. So like, you said Lorca and Whitman? And, and uh, I cannot memorize it so easily, but. And then I discovered uh, like the contemporary Ukrainian poetry. Uh, I discovered it uh, together with Ukrainian poetry, which, which existed during Soviet time, and where people were books were forbidden, people were killed somewhere in gulags and so on. And uh, this poetry was great. But uh, what I discovered, because you know you have the Soviet lobby, and then when Ukraine grows independent, you have very strong anti-Soviet lobby. So whatever uh, we had in books in school, and whatever we had in books in bookstores, was mostly uh, about that Ukraine should live forever, all the communists are big evil, we should die, but Ukrainians should stay. And uh, when you are 14 or 15, you are kind of fed up with this, like, very ideological poetry. You're sticking for something else. Way later, when uh, the Ukrainian publishing system uh, grew, I discovered another poetry by those people, which was great. But as so, uh, there was some time when I was considering all Ukrainian literature like really boring and not up to date and not for people at all. Only like some dry ideas with no life in it. Later on, I discovered a lot of nice Ukrainian literature from 18th and 19th and 20th century, but... And then I discovered uh, the modern Ukrainian literature. And uh, it was fantastic because I never thought Ukrainian poetry can be like that, like, without struggling the communists, uh, without uh, struggling the difficult life, just talking about uh, another ideas, another things. Uh, like going back to uh, our historical past, but without this inner like inner fight, just describing important things, uh, just describing emotions, just describing what is going on between people. And then later on, I discovered more of American poetry, like beatniks. Uh, I discovered Sylvia Plath. Uh, uh, 
I discovered Polish poet and writer Martin Sitlitsky, which is great. Uh, and I discovered a lot, a lot, a lot of valuable authors. I discovered some uh, of modern uh, Russian poetry, which is also great. Later on, I discovered all the Russian-speaking poets, uh, which are great, are living either in Ukraine or in Israel. And yeah, <laughs> that's the issue. And, uh, okay, so, so we talked about influence. Let, let's try to talk a bit about the process of writing poetry. So when, you, when, you, um, when you're going into poetry, what, what makes you move? What makes your mental being move? What, what is the thing that throws you into poetry? A scene you see, a thought you have, um, maybe a moment in time where your mentality is ready for something or open for something. What, what takes you into poetry? Okay, uh, when I teach creative writing in Ukraine, as I do, I always uh, describe to people something that every uh, good text should have, which is the plot and the idea. And how do you check if there is a plot and the idea is that you can answer the questions, what had happened and what do I have or what do I see from this? So uh, basically any situation, any story, any event uh, which makes me to think about something and to uh, come to some idea because I mean it's way too easy to place the idea itself in, in poetry. No, you should create the situation when the reader comes to the idea. You should transfer the experience and the emotion which leads the reader to the same or maybe different, but to some new idea. That's I, I would say that's the meaning of it, because uh, like the emotion is uh, very powerful, powerful information up to me. And so yeah, any any uh, emotional situation, any like uh, real real event, I, I which I can tell about in a way to make people to feel the same and to be to be present in this situation is the this source of start. I, I saw that when I read your book in Hebrew, I saw that a lot of the poems are um, are dedicated to um, to people. Like people people create for you this opening. I saw that you have poems that are addressing friends. I suppose I, I from everything I have written I have four poems dedicated to people and they are really? all in this book. Okay. Yes. There is a poem for uh, Named all, which which is a writer who uh, have passed away already, Ukrainian writer. Uh, the poem uh, dedicated to Sergei Dan, who is Ukrainian no, writer. No, 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 never I'm not die. talking about dedicated poem when you have uh, I got someone. It wrong. Yeah, not not when you dedicate the poem to someone and you said in, in the beginning of the poem or before the poem. I'm saying that the poems themselves they talk about people. They talk. They're addressing people. People you see. People that that. that you catch them in some moment, or you try to talk to them, or you try to to, to convince them to go out sometimes of a, of a conflict or a dark that, place? Uh, well, uh, since I write about things that are happening in the world, uh, real or emotional or whatever else, it's very difficult to have something happen without people participating in this. So I write about that, and also I'm the human being, and that's the only experience I really can use. So no, but what I'm trying to say is sometimes you have this approach of poetry which is ironic, and it's it, it's with some distance from the, the the scene of the poem. Like the the poet sits outside, observing life, observing the environment, and and in a way thinking. Like Milos is a, is a very um, good example. Actually, it's also the one of my beloved poets. Yeah, Milos, I forgot. Milos is much. great, but Milos some, sometimes have these po poems. When he sits outside of the, the events or outside of the actual world and he thinks about it. And I feel that in your poetry, you're very much involved. The poem is inside the world. He talks from inside and not an observer of the, of the Because world. that's the place where I want to place the reader in the middle of, of the situation. So, and the easiest way I would say to make uh, this is say, I'm right here in the middle of this, come here and experience the same. So that's what I do, maybe because of that. Yeah, invite me inside. Yeah. Okay, you, you talked about, uh, you said for a moment that, that you talk about life and you talk about um, conflict, so I really, it's like, 
you know, a question you have to ask in Israel. And you know that the funny thing when I came to Ukraine, uh, all the questions I got from the media was about the conflict. Like, I was like, someone coming from a place of 70 years of conflict now talk to us when we have only three years of conflict. Or it was one year of conflict. So I want to ask if, if how the conflict influenced your poetry, in which way, in which way he, he goes inside the poetry, and in which way maybe sometimes the poetry is, is, is an attempt to avoid or, or stand against the conflict and say you're not going to poison my life all the time with your noise and I'm going to create also beauty and rhythm in the world which is facing you or in a way fighting you without directly approaching you. I have never expected I'm going to write about the war and I do not really write about the war, but since it exists in Ukraine, it has been the background for everything what is happening. Like the first year was really difficult because it was everywhere. Uh, on the any any level of your dealing with your life, you had something from that. Like your friends would be killed around the you would have to give money to equip the army. Uh, there would be a lot of issues all about that. But then, in a year or so, uh, you get used to it. It is still going on, and you are still uh, living your life. And it keeps being present as a background in everything we do and in everything uh, we deal with. So somehow it sneaks into almost every poem I have written during the past four years. Uh, it's not conscious, it's not by intention, but it happens as a metaphor, as a detail, as a memory, as a important, important thing to talk about. It is there. And uh, I never had an idea to do it like by intention, but somehow it happens. And that was actually the key of uh, existing these books, because uh, this was something that uh, Israeli audience took really close at the very beginning after those poems were first read in Hebrew. Uh, they, there was a person asking me, why do you write so much about Israel? And I said, like, wow, I, I do not write about Israel like at all. And then we discovered that this background war, that this background is... is the Common, yes, the common background in a way. So since I write about the emotions and about the experiences, uh, not naming like the places, the conflict, the size of the conflict, and so on, then it becomes like a bit more general, so very common for us. I, I have another question that now occurred in my mind because it's it's, uh, it's, a, it's a private question, let's say, because I'm dealing with the same thing, and that's the different approach in writing between poetry and prose, because you do both, I mm. do both, and it's completely, I think it's completely different, it's like a, a different... I think it's all the same. Yeah? Okay, so we have... Transfer the experience. It depends on the idea and on the emotion and on the amount of information you need to transfer this experience. Uh, so you choose, you need a poem or you need a novel. But, you, you, you but the process is the same. The same. You, you the miracle is the same, so... If you do it good. But, uh, um, uh, no, uh, your, your mental place is the same. When you write poetry, when you write prose, you feel the same inside. Your spiritual being, your, your mental being is the same. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same feeling. Yes, yes. Yes. Because I, I mean, prose demands more work because it's like you, you know you see the stone and you see the image in the stone something. So then you take the hammer and some piece of iron and you knock on the piece of iron and it depends on the size of the stone. Uh, if you want to see the small sculpture, you knock for three days. If you uh, need something huge, you knock for thirty years. But still, it's like the same work you I, do. I, I, I will give you this metaphor, which I think about. You know, in Israel, we have a very strong distinguish between secular life and religious life. We have this argument in society. And I feel the same way about poetry and prose. Poetry is, is religious life, and prose is secular life. And it's really like it. Mm. For me, poetry is always deeply inside a spiritual quest. 
a moment of, of discovering, a moment of, of praising, even if you write about the most daily things. And, and prose is secular life. For me, prose is about the big structures of humanity, the structure of uh, society, politics, economy, and so on. So for me, it's really like, and, and it's fun. I have, I have parts in me which are secular. I have parts in me which are religious. So I move between them. But when I write poetry, I'm in one place. And when I write prose, I'm in another place. No, I, I would say both cases you have described, for me, present both in prose and in poetry. Everything mixed, obviously. I'm the singer of the mixture today. Yes. Okay. So um, let's see our time. OK, we'll do a few more questions. Um, one thing that, that was, I, I mentioned it, um, yes, last night and, and was very strong to me in reading your poetry is this combination between what I try to say as, as colorful, colorful language, joyful language, I would say, like a language that is very rich, the taste is very rich, and this great tune that, that is inside the poems. Like you have this great tune <coughs> that is facing the conflicts of, of, of the society or the conflicts of the inner life. You have this um, sound of, of, I won't say sadness, but melancholy place, you know. And then in the other hand, this kind of one rhythm is full of many different voices of joyful life, of colors and, and plants and smell, and, and it's, it's very central. So I, I want you to try to, to talk about this combination that you have in your poetry? It happens naturally, because uh, if you are not suffering some certain kind of mental disorder, where you are uh, either always super happy or unhappy, then you have it all both on a daily basis. Like, it's hot here, and but we have a nice conversation. We got into traffic jam, but yesterday I had a good release. There is a war in Ukraine, but still life is happening. Uh, there is a lot of conflicts in Israel which makes life not so easy here, but still the country is beautiful, and so far and so on. You can hardly find some single thing or object which makes you only happy or only unhappy. It influences you at the same time both ways. So this is the income and this is the outcome. You get this from walls and you give it back as your poetry or your prose because my prose is all the same. Like you can have some really dark parts combined with some really heavy emotions and vice versa. And another thing I wanted to ask is about we talked about it before and I didn't um, stop for a moment to understand it. But that's the, that's for me very interesting from my background and my father. What is your approach to to this? shade of Russian culture or this complicated relationship between the Russian culture and the Ukrainian culture. I'm not talking about politics now, I'm not talking about you know war and conflict, I'm talking about culture. Because it's 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 very close one to another. It's mixed for, for a long time. After so, years and years and years thinking about this, I have developed the idea that I cannot think there is something like Russian culture because the uh, country is huge and there are a lot of people and a lot of minds, a lot of ideas and a lot of approaches. So uh, some heritage of Russian country, uh, culture and something that is still happening in Russia now, like in cultural meaning, is really great and something is uh, up to me, ideologically wrong, and something is just low quality cultural product, and then you just carefully pick, you stop because you actually you can say this like the same about every culture. Is Ukrainian culture like good or bad for you? I don't know because I like this and this and no, this. No, I'm talking about. It's not about good and bad. For example, we we just this it, week. It's not really good and bad. It's just that my English is uh, poor enough to explain no, this good. better. I'm, I'm trying to I give you an example from really the actual life in Israel. Like these days, we had this big debate. We have a Palestinian poet, which is considered to be the national Palestinian poet, Mahmoud Darwish. Uh, he's a great poet, and and he's a symbol for the Palestinians. And then in some ceremony of, of getting some rewards. 
one of the, the um, artists that get the award wanted to do a, a, a poem, but by the way, it's a very nice poem, very human poem. And uh, the Minister of Culture was against it. Now, she was against it not because of the, the value, the artistic value of the poem, but because, you know, and that's what I'm asking. When you read Pushkin or you read Gogol or you read Dostoevsky, do you, do you have this kind of... No, I uh, educated myself not to consider something as Russian, but to consider it important or not right or not so wrong, valuable or not. And so this is my approach. If, he, if I read Pushkin, I don't think he's Russian. I think he's a great poet and yeah, great prose nice. writer. Yeah. And we have a lot of issues now in Ukraine when there is, let's say, the singer who is super beloved and super popular. And then he does an interview for the Russian channel and says something very tolerant to Russia participations in, in the conflict in, the east of Ukraine, and then everybody is starting to hate him. But still, the music he does is the same. Uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of uh, great Russian-speaking writers in Ukraine, because historically, uh, most part of the population of Ukraine are bilingual people. Uh, they grew up with the Russian language around them, and they are still great writer and great writers and great minds, and people bring great ideas. But since they are doing this in Russian, being inhabitants of Ukraine, they have problems in order to get their books published or to get their readings in public, because then you would have some extra right-wing guys coming and saying, we're not gonna hear Russian language in Ukraine never ever anymore. I mean, that's the issue in the society, but my, my personal uh, choice is not consider something as Russian or not Russian, but consider something as valuable or not valuable. Okay, so let, let's talk a minute about the rhythm and music in poetry. And, and I, will, I will share a thought I have, and then I would like to hear what, what you have to say. And, and that's that in, in Israeli poetry, um, we have some section of, of poetry that has harmony and music and rhythm. It's a very small one, the majority is a free, free verse and all of it. And, and I do also, I write in, in without rhythm, basically. And I think about it as in, in this way, that the world outside is disharmonic. The, 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 the technical, uh, contemporary world for me is disharmonic. It's a lot of noises, a lot of channels, a lot of voices that go up on each other, there is no elegancy, there is no harmony outside. So in a way I say, I, I reflect it in my poetry. My poetry is also without harmony because I'm addressing the present. So what do you think about it? What do you, th you have harmony? I consider that my present outside of me is quite harmonical. I see the harmony and the beauty even in the things you can call disharmonical and even in the cases of disharmony, I still uh, see the music and the, the beauty. So, uh, so I, I mean, this is a joke, I'm not sure I can tell uh, since we are recording this on video, but I will. Uh, the Ukrainian uh, saying which says, uh, do you know why does the cat lick his balls? Because he can. So uh, our language is very good to uh, create the melodical poetry. Of course, this harmony and rhythm and rhyme should not be the main aim of the poetry because you are transferring the experience. You are not like creating some beautiful words together with no meaning. But since our language is good to this, this uh, gives so much extra abilities to the poetry then I, I would rather use it, and I do. And I know a lot of writers uh, in Ukraine are doing this also, because the language is super cool for this. It's interesting, because when I think about, uh, when I think about Hebrew, in that perspective, just now the, the thought occurred to me that, that Hebrew is also a language that is good with rhythm and harmony, but like what I said last night, it's it been used so perfectly by the poets or the, the, the voice of Tehilim, they, they brought the language to such level of perfect in harmony that you cannot deal with it anymore. Like everything we do in our language these days is in the big shadow of 
for bigger uh, biblical writers. And in a way, they they took all the ability of harmony from our language because we cannot go back to this kind of uh, complete harmony. So I get your we... point. I'm lucky you because uh, <laughs> our language is uh, very alive and it changes all the time, like involving new words uh, from new things that are appearing in the world. So uh, I'm happy to use it all. Um, yeah, you're happy generally. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I feel Sometimes. like a depressed, a depressed Israeli. Uh, Maybe you're just more clever, so... No, no, no. no. Um, okay, another question. Maybe it will be the last one. Is about another thing that I, I, I think about a lot here, and that's the relationship between young writers and writers in general. Do you have in Ukraine this feeling of a community which you talk to each other, you influence each other, you have some debates on political issues, you, you have this kind of ongoing conversation one to another. It's in a way like like with Russia. When you deal with people, you deal with individual, his minds and his ideas. So uh, then I don't look like if the person is a writer or not. We have some several uh, communities of writers uh, dependent on the age, the language, the ideas, the whatever else, and some of them are against each other, and some of them are supporting each other, and I don't participate in all these things. Like some of Ukrainian writers are uh, really good friends of mine. Uh, some I consider to be like totally uh, disgusting people, but they still write good. Some people are super nice and they are friends of mine, but I wouldn't say I, I'm really into their writing. So, I mean, obviously we are influenced by each other because this is something we read, and if you read something, you get influenced by this, more or less. But, uh, no, but what about the community? Uh, there are a few communities uh, of writers or poets in Ukraine, but I wouldn't say uh, I belong to any of them. No, and there are other people who also do not belong to any community, just just write. No, but I'm talking less about um, like reading each other and more about debating or make a, a place for for criticism or or debates. We do it on Facebook. <laughs> on Facebook. Yes. Not on the papers. No, we do it on Facebook. What do you mean? Somebody put a post. Yes, there is. I mean, the poets are works popularly in a way. So uh, they write something, or they would write some chronicle to some online uh, media, and then a million people would come and comment and discuss this. Some other poets, some regular people, some whoever can do this, because if you uh, tell about the traditions of debates in newspapers or on paper, I don't think it exists now in Ukraine. It used to to to, to be like. Uh, 600 years ago when you had these religious papers and people would sit in different monasteries and write the articles to uh, polemize with each other but it doesn't work like this anymore. No, so we do it on Facebook. So you say the most important poetic stage now in Ukraine is Facebook? No, the most important debating stage is, debating. is Facebook, yes. But about poetry? Even about poetry. We have a couple of festivals and book fairs with also the literature program uh, that create this uh, healthy, uh, healthy atmosphere to uh, communicate, to meet, to meet each other, to uh, exchange the, the thoughts and the ideas. And it's good to have this, but I wouldn't say uh, this really influences what do people write afterwards. Okay, I think, uh, yeah, I think we did it, so thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you very much, thank you, for thank you very much for coming.